Welcome to the eMarketing Assessment Support Overview, or in other words, the bootcamp. This is just an overview of some of the ways and means by which you can get the assessment tasks done, do well, and have a better time of it. And it's also about explaining some of the assumptions that underpin the assignments and the way I want you to operate in this subject. So it's the how-to guide. The key things are research, reading, notes, writing, following up. And the thing I want you to be clear on here is that if you're watching this and you're going, yeah, I know that, I know that, congratulations. That's your accreditation. That's the, yeah, I'm doing it right. If you're watching this going, well, that's new, this is your chance to put these ideas into practice this semester for your benefit. As far as I'm concerned, if at the end of the semester, Everyone's followed through on this, everyone's done well, I've had a good semester and I'll put up with the paperwork that comes with that. So, the idea here is it's about giving you an insight of how to do things in a way that's going to be you know, best interest to you. Score more points for effort expended. So, let's start with the first thing. Research. If you're doing the theory stream, three assignments. If you're doing the practice stream, three assignments and a bunch of stuff that you need to do during the weeks. Now research here isn't just about diving into Google Scholar, although that's a big part of it. Research here is about going, here is a problem I need to solve. What do people already know about solving this problem? Now I know that there is this whole sort of bravado thing about not reading the manual. And yeah, I'm part of that too. I get my software, I open it up, I don't look at the instructions. But when I can't do a thing, I will go to the internet, to Google and to YouTube to find tutorials on how to do the particular task, how to solve the problem I currently got. And that's research. It's a great skill to have because once you've got it and you know how to find an answer, when you're presented with a problem you can't deal with, you know how to go off and get yourself out of the situation you're in. So, key here is what's already known about the topic. A lot of the time, a lot of students tend to feel that they have to demonstrate, you know, they'll reinvent the wheel to show you know, cleverness. That shows poor resource allocation and inefficient behaviours, and that's not what we reward. With your assignment topics, you got a set of questions with your assignment activities, and this applies across all of your subjects. When you get an assignment question, the first thing you want to know is, well, what's already been known about this topic? What's already been written about this? So you want to hit up the research front on this. Your theoretical, and your literal theoretical underpinning here is that it is easier to adapt an existing idea than it is to create a new one. From innovation adoption theory, a quite new innovation, one that is based on existing ideas, is far easier to use to understand and apply than one that's a really new innovation that basically was a make it up as we went along. So this is about making it easier. This is about having a better time of it. So to do your research, for you, when you get told, apply theory. Go to Google Scholar. Scholar Google.com.au is one of your best assets you've got, but do it on campus. If you try doing this off campus, all you're going to do is get disappointed and annoyed. If you're into getting disappointed and annoyed, fine, do it. But if you want to get your best results here, do your research whilst you're on an ANU or another university IP range, because you'll get access to the files. If we've got the subscription to that journal, you can get that file. Life's a lot easier. So on Scholar, throw in keywords, throw in specific phrases, look at assessments, look at the question, try and find you know, the core of the question, throw that into Scholar, see what comes up. Remember, the lecturer who set this has probably read some of the materials that you're going to find in Scholar, so it was those ideas that influenced them to ask the specific question you're now facing. So we're all building and riffing on existing ideas because that's what's most effective. Do your research, 
get to read some of the backstory, and it becomes easier. Now, as it happens, ANU Academic Skills has some resources on this, so your link's there. Go check it out, even if you've done it before, see if there's something new, or just give yourself that reminder of, yeah, I know this, I know this, I know this, I'm good at this. So, research is your first step, but your second step is you want to capture the information. When you come across a PDF file, save it. Download it and save it. That is your priority one. If you're still into reading things on pieces of paper, sure, print it after that. But never print first, save second. Always save first, print second. Because it's a lot easier to reprint a PDF than it is to try it and at the last minute go, where is that file? I had this thing in paper, what have I done with it? The other thing is your average PDF file is worth about 30 bucks Australian, up to about 75 Australian, depending on where you're buying it from. So with a good research library built up over three years here, you can start turning a profit per subject. You wanna get yourself a good naming protocol, absolutely important, you do not want the use the original file name that was comes with the PDF because those are designed for computers, not for humans. Now, I use two different filing protocols. I will either use a topical, where I'll grab a whole bunch of things about a particular area I wanna work on on a literature review. So I'll grab 30 articles on Instagram, I'll throw them all in one folder, and then I'll rename that entire set of files Instagram. And it will automatically give me Instagrams one to 30. That's great, but that doesn't also help if I'm going, so I've got a citation here, Dan and Dan 2007, which file was that? So there's a pro and con to it. On the year, if you've got a citation in your paper and you're going, yep, I need to go back and look this up or confirm this, or I think it was these authors, that makes life easier. You can find them, but it doesn't necessarily tell you what your topic's about. But however you do it, when you're writing your notes, when you're taking your notes, your PDF file name goes on the notes. So when you start, if you're going to take notes in Excel, your first cell is, what's the name of the PDF? That way you can find the paper again later. The other thing is that if you're working across multiple assignments and multiple assessment tasks, file the papers you're using for that assignment with that particular assessment. Drive space is cheap and plentiful. Duplicate copies aren't an issue. It's much easier to find a paper of, what was the paper I was reading about this for this essay if it's in the same folder as your essay draft? So multiple files are okay. Downloading again several times, okay. Just get yourself a protocol and stick to it. Now, critical thing, the statement of the blindingly obvious, and it's blindingly obvious because you can't see it. Downloading and printing doesn't count as reading. If it did, I would have done much better in my university times because I would have gone in, photocopied a bunch of things and learned stuff, as opposed to photocopying a bunch of things, never reading them and not learning anything. All I did was spend money for a dead tree. Downloading doesn't count as reading. You've got to actually actively engage what's going on. So, your first pass. As you're reading, you're grabbing it, going, I think that could be useful. Chuck it in your folder, get your new file names. Go through, sort, prioritize, and work out, okay, I want to, which one do I want to read? You've got to be selective. It's a skill that you learn. It's not a skill you start with. It's a skill that's a graduate attribute. So by the time you leave, you should at least be capable of doing this. On the way through, it's practice and training. So go through your files, work out the ones that look most interesting for the assignment topic. As you're reading through the file, have your assignment question to hand, have it nearby, so you can just reference, look at it and go, right, does this paper help me solve that problem? Does it help me address that? I find for my, for my time, a quick skim of the abstract, a quick check of the conclusion, and then back to the literature review usually lets me know if the paper is worth going through in fine tooth comb. Does it help advance my argument? Does it look like there's an idea in here I can use? If there is, I'll make a note of it, but I'm coming back to that paper. 
and then I'm going to go through it in depth for notes. But you want to give it a quick skim to start with, then come back. So on the notes, this is where, the, where it gets to be really important. When you're taking your notes, there are a couple of different ways of doing it, but top of your list of things you want to be thinking about is you're only interested in the ideas. There is no reason for you to write down a passage of words that already exists in that paper because that's not useful. It's wasting your time and your effort. So you want to summarise the paper. You want to be able to give the paper a summary point of what was the key idea? What was the critical, what was the thought? But as you're reading this paper, if you get prompted to start thinking, and this is, a, this is the high-end, upper-end game plan here. You're reading the paper, and you're looking at your assignment question, you start having ideas about how you'd answer that paper. Make a note of that with those prompts, those thoughts, with your notes around this paper. Highlight it saying, no, it's yours, and you were thinking about this. But then that's, when you're writing that up, acknowledge this paper because that was influencing your thinking. This is how you pick up your HDs, is knowing what was the influences, what was giving you this drive to think about the question in this way. Now, if note-taking, there are some choices to make. Basically, active, the more active you are in the reading of it, the more likely you are to remember it. It's CB theory says that involvement, which is con conscious cognitive effort, improves recall. We know this. We know it from CB. We know it from advertising. So you want to be tuned in. You want to be focused. You want to be in the moment. Summary notes that just stick to ideas and your own thoughts greatly reduces your risk of it going pear-shaped when you put it into turn it in. And notes are so much easier to put into structures that when you want to write an essay and you've got a cluster of ideas together, it's a lot easier to draw out those ideas from the notes pages and go, all right, here's my skeleton outline, here are my keynote ideas in there, here's the page I'm going to refer it back to, a lot easier. And this is how you get, you spend all that time downloading files and looking up things and doing the research, this is how you start building up for the payoff. So notes are really a good way to get yourself set up for the payoff. Now there is an efficiency effectiveness argument. It's really efficient to take your notes in Excel or Word because you can then search. You can do a lot. Uh, there's a lot of note taking software packages out there. It's pretty efficient. It's fast. You can type much faster than you can handwrite. The problem is the reason why you can type faster than you can handwrite is that it's a lower involvement skill set. It's incredibly annoying because it would be great if our typing used the same conscious uh, cognitive skill set as our writing. That way we'd learn much faster. It doesn't. Handwritten notes are more effective for recall because it's a more conscious cognitive activity. It's a higher level of involvement so you think more as you're taking notes by hand. The con is your notes by hand aren't searchable. So you want to work out, most people are not going to have time to take a bunch of handwritten notes, then type those notes up into a searchable database, and then write an assignment. That's your perfect world, find your balance. Find what works for you. What you don't want to do is I do not, there's no excuse to copy and paste when you're doing notes. Just, there isn't. If there is a paragraph that is miraculously perfect to the answer, it's a trap. Don't do it. No piece of text written by somebody else is more used to you in the writing of an assignment than your own interpretation. Because you win points for how you, as the student, interpret the ideas and use those ideas to solve the problem set by the assignment topic. If you stick somebody else's words in there, you're not going to be using your own ideas and you are not getting the points. In fact, what you're doing is you are intentionally taking a $50 note, setting fire to it and looking confused as to why you, suddenly you don't have money anymore. Don't do it. Don't do it. 
Copy and paste is a waste of time because Control C, Control V, no cognitive effort. You won't remember the materials you're copying into a file. It never works. Similarly, never copy anything into your master document that you're writing your assignment in. There is no reason to copy and paste from an external source into your master document because the, oh, I'll just rewrite that, or I'll just paraphrase that, or I'll just move the words around and paraphrase it. You'll forget, and you are the one who stabbed yourself in the leg. Nobody else did, and there's no need to. Don't do it. Right, this is the money. This is where, the, this is also the fun bit. I know writing is very stressful for a lot of people, and I'm a professional writer. I've been trained in several degrees, a lot of private practice. I took formal training in romance writing and science fiction writing. And I probably have written well over a million words. It's fun. It's also really stressful, but it's fun. It's a challenge. It's why we're here. So what you want to do to make it work for you is this is about you. This is your own words. So the first thing you want to understand is that first draft is not final draft. You don't have to get it right first go. The old mantra that used to sit over my computer was, you can't edit a blank page. And it doesn't need to be perfect, it just needs to be. Get a draft down, get the process going. If, you've got a if you like writing to a structure, get your structure out, start filling in the sentences, sentences to paragraph, paragraph, build. Iterative builds, if that works for you, go with it. If you're a stream of consciousness writer who will come back and edit later, get you write multiple drafts. Write, write everything out, close the file, don't save it. Write everything out again, close the file, don't save it. If that works for you, do it. I like saving versions and copies. Whatever you, a writing approach where it works for you, write early. Write early, write often. Because the thing you need to appreciate about what you're doing as a student is you're working out at the gym. This is your training. This is your workout regime. Which is why if you haven't been writing during a semester and you come to the end of semester and you hit an assignment, why it hurts is that you are trying to lift an incredibly heavy weight with no training, no bulking up behind you. But if you're writing regularly and you're writing frequently, you're getting your technique together, you're getting your stamina up, you're building up your capacity to write at pace over time. So it's a really good ongoing routine skill set to get into. Write often, write multiple drafts, be willing to throw a draft away and start again because that's what your training is. And this is why we ask you to start early is so you can do this. So you've got time to get the practice and also, because writing's a hell of a lot of fun. The number of people who have come to me at the end of an assignment goes, ah, oh, I know I wrote it in the last four hours, but it was great. I just, I felt so annoyed I didn't have a chance to like, do more, work with it more. So it should be fun for you because you got it, but it's also going to be a challenge. So knowing it's a challenge, you've got to come out with the right mindset. And you also got to remember, it's a skill that requires training. You wouldn't go into the gym and try and deadlift a weight well outside your lifting capacity first go, but if you took yourself six weeks worth of training, bulking up and building up, you could go deal with a much heavier weight than you did at the start. So it's all about training. What you want to do with the writing. Essays are arbitrary things that only exist for a single purpose, and that is to ensure we can say you are a certain level of good. Sliding scale from, all right, you're okay, to, yes, you are good, you are brilliant. So what you want to do is you want to work out where to put yourself on that sliding scale. Showing understanding is the key. You want to be able to say, here's the question, here's my interpretation, here's my answer. And to do that, what we're looking for is we're looking for demonstrable skill sets. Application of knowledge. This is why direct quotes suck. They take your application of knowledge away from you. 
it's basically going and ordering uh, it's ordering a drink at the pub, pouring half of it out on the floor and wondering why you didn't get value for money when you don't you're not getting the best out of it. So you take your question and what you want to do with this is you want to respond to the question. You want to use the existing literature because that's the skill we're looking for is can you take what already exists and bring it together? The word we use is synthesize, but what we're saying here is can you take what is already out there, interpret it and use it in a context to answer this question that we've set for you and acknowledge that this idea came from here, here and here. We're also looking for technical skills. Can you write? Can you communicate your message? This is a graduate attribute we're looking for. And can you recognize when you're using someone else's gear? I mean, this is one of the things that's most important is that you can use other people's ideas if you acknowledge them. If you don't acknowledge them, you run into a lot of trouble. And at this point, it's going to be just marks lost. Later, it's going to be lawyers involved. But you can use someone else's patent if you license that patent from them. Whereas the same activity of using that patent, if you don't acknowledge this through the appropriate approaches, you're in a load of trouble. So we're teaching you appropriate ways to acknowledge the influence and to use the ideas of others and to build on what already exists. In terms of knocking out a draft, one of the things you'll find is that as you're belting out an assignment, you'll be typing away and then there'll be that bit of oh, that idea, you know, that really scratchy idea that you're trying to figure out. Uh, it was so-and-so, author and author, I can't, I can't remember. Don't stop. Throw yourself a mark attack. Now I use the symbols uh, square bracket F7 square bracket as my mark attack of come back and look at this later. That way I don't break the, the rhythm of typing, I don't break the rhythm of writing. I can go, here's the thing I need to come back to, F7, come back to it. Then when the first draft is down or I've finished it off a draft or I, you know, I'm at that point in the afternoon, if I don't feel like writing but I know I need to work on my essay, I can go back through, look for those F7 tags and find where I need to go out to Google and look for something or I need to check my notes for something or I need to work on an area. Writing is a certain flow of mindset and behaviours that if you stay in that flow for as long as you can, you get more words down. You then come back, editing is a different flow of behaviours and a different process. So editing, what you want to do is write, tag up as you go, come back, edit, find those tags, patch up and fix up. You'll also find and this is, for those of you hunting that HD, what kills HDs off is three quarters of the essay is this beautifully referenced, well-supported, well-arguments driven paper. And then suddenly there's a quarter of this essay that's, yeah, reckon, mate, I think, and there's no support. You come back to that paragraph and you go, ah, oh, that's a whole paragraph with no references. I'm going to go look through this paragraph and do follow-up research. I'm going to find support for these arguments. I've made arguments here. I've learned these arguments from somewhere. When you do that and you find those supporting arguments and you find that supporting material, that pushes you up over that invisible line between D and HD, the difference maker, that little spark we look for is awareness of influence. So you're doing that. Look for sections where you, you haven't used references. Throw stuff into Google and Google Scholar and see if someone else... Now you may feel that you've written an absolutely original piece of work that no one in the world's ever done before. Chuck it in Scholar, chuck it in Google, see if it shows up. If it does, go read what they have to say and see how close it is to what you said and acknowledge it. Bring them in. It makes your argument stronger. You, as the genius, sat there and derived from basic principles an idea that 35 other people have also derived from, you are clever. To be clever and smart about it, if you say, I thought of this up, and so did these other 30 people, therefore, look how right we are, 
that's a stronger argument than trying to deny that some other that someone else somewhere might have thought of the idea you also had. So strength is in numbers, support and acknowledging influences. So the last thing I'm going to say, two things on this. First, be nice to yourself. Cut yourself some slack. Essays are difficult. That's their purpose. They are a challenge for you to rise up to. We train you to meet this challenge. And we give you advice of, well, you can't do this at the last minute. You should start early. Do you know why we give you that advice? So you don't have an unpleasant time. I mean, I don't mind. If you want to hurt yourself, feel free. Go ahead. I don't care how you get to the finish line. I care about the document you give me. So I don't care about your effort input ratio. I care about your output. The thing about readings is that the readings reduce the difficulty level. If you've read around what other people are thinking, you get influenced by their writing style. You get to see how they structure phrases. You get to see how they put an argument together. You learn from it. It improves your writing. One of the best ways to improve your writing is to improve your reading. When you've taken notes from those readings, it's so much easier to turn a block of your translations of other people's ideas into your own words because you're building on what you've already learned. No perfect quote exists, so don't go looking for one. If a perfect quote does exist, people like me who are lecturers use those perfect quotes on people like you as students, and we use them for assessment tasks. Because the perfect quote exists, we'll hit you with it first. The other thing is that I hear this quite often, and this is, look, I really appreciate this. I want to say this absolutely genuinely, I appreciate where you're coming from. A lot of students come to me and say, but I had to use a direct quote because how can I, the way that they have expressed this idea in these words is better than I could ever. It's like, yeah, it's better now. But if you don't train and you don't practice, you're never going to be as good as that person. There are some writers who will be better than you. That's just the nature of the game. But if you never use your own words, you're not even going to get up to that level. You're not even going to get a run on. You need to start. And you also need to appreciate that the writer you're sitting there going, oh, I, can't, I, cannot, I cannot do injustice to this paragraph by paraphrasing it. It's like, well, this person started in the same boat you were in. They looked at people's work and said, well, I can give it a go because this is what my training is about. This essay is a training exercise for me to practice my skills as an author. So this is why, you know, cut yourself some slack. Do it, do it the less difficult way. If there's an easy way and a hard way and both are going to give you a great return, don't take the hardest possible path. It's inefficient and it's contrary to the graduate outcomes we're trying to teach you. And the last thing. Yes, you can do the essay in four hours before the deadline. Look, I know I'm breaking, I'm breaking policy to tell you this, but yeah, you can. It's going to hurt. And you're going to suffer. There'll be the migraines, there'll be the cough, there'll be the shakes, there'll be the tears, there'll be the stress, there'll be the decidedly uncomfortable experience of knowing that my hands hurt, I'm tired, I just want this to end. I've got 90 minutes left and it's only halfway there. Oh God, oh God. I've been there. I do that. I've done this. All right, I've done last minute deadline runs. You're not the first. You won't be the last. Sometimes it's amazing. Sometimes it is just one of the most pure, adrenaline-filled, junky rush you can get. Other times, it hurts and smashing your head against a wall seems like a logical alternative. So, it's up to you. I'm going to trust you. How you want to run it is how you want to run it. If you want to do it as, all right, I'm going to crack open the assessment and get it started and do it in four hours at the last, in the last four hours before the assignment's due, go for it. It could end in triumph, it could end in tragedy. But if you're really absolutely desperately keen to get that four hour burst experience, why not just do it on a Tuesday? 
why not just sit down, chuck a timer on, put a give a mate uh, the instructions that the four hour mark better come in, rip the USB drive out, and walk. You could give yourself the same experience, but then also not actually have the uh, catastrophic, if it doesn't work, catastrophic fail. So if you want to do it in four hours, you can. If you want to do it in the last minute, you can. It's your call. But just acknowledge when we lay the stuff out of do it in advance, do it in piecemeal, do it in sequences, we're doing it because actually this can be really fun if you do it this way and you can have a better time of it and it can be less stressful and you can actually like like you volunteer to be at the university, this is an elective course, you volunteer to be part of it, let's make this the best experience you can have. And here's a way to go and take a bunch of pressure and, under, and stress off yourself so you can have a better time of it. So, up to you, your call. So, any questions about your assessment, what's your expectations, anything else like that, there's my connect points. Talk to me. If you've got worries about the assessment or the expectation, talk to me write to me, contact me. My job involves helping you understand what to do. If you don't take advantage of that asset that's there and you are lost and you are confused, I can't and I'm not going to go looking for you because I'm going to trust you to be self-sufficient. Part of your self-sufficiency is coming to me when you've got a problem and saying, hey, I need your help to solve it. Knowing what your resources are and when you need to go to external support is one of your skills we're trying to train in. So you need me, you can come find me.